Hey guys, welcome to what is a very, very important video. What we're going to be discussing now is a key square theory, which is something that applies to King and Pawn endgames exclusively. It's not the only concept that you should know, you should be familiar with in King and Pawn endgames, but it's absolutely one of the most important. And the good news is that it is, in my opinion, quite straightforward. So, Let's take a look at this position here, and we see that only white can consider maybe going for a win. But if I ask you the question, what is the evaluation of this position? So is it a win or is it a draw? How would you go about actually answering this? So unless you're familiar with key square theory, you may go about answering this by Maybe imagining in your head that the king will move either forward via e3 or via c3, or perhaps even pushing the pawn, and somehow then you're imagining in your head that black will respond with some move, and then after this, maybe from there he will go here or here or here, although you're probably thinking this is unlikely. I mean, you're probably more than anything considering one of these squares for the king, and then maybe you're playing out that position in your head. But as you can imagine, that's a very inefficient method because you have to sort of calculate a lot of variations, a lot of possibilities before you can arrive at some kind of position that you know to be a draw. So instead of this, what we should be using is key square theory to make our decision very simple. So instead of this, what we should be using is our knowledge of key squares to arrive at an answer very simply. So the first question is, what is a key square? Well, a key square is a square that we decide with the extra pawn want to bring our king to. And if we can get our king to that square, we guarantee victory. And we guarantee we forget about opposition or zugzwang or any other concept in chess and in chess endgames, all we need to concern ourselves with is landing our king onto one of those key squares, and after that we know we are in a theoretically winning position. So, what are the key squares for this particular pawn on d3? Well, there are a few ways to think about it, but very simply, what I say to my students is we skip a row, and then it's the square immediately in front and then to the right and to the left. So the three squares skipping one row, the three squares in front of the pawn, and then the adjacent squares to the right and left. So for a pawn on d3, we have these three key squares. Now, once again, our definition of a key square is a square where if we get our king to it, it will guarantee us a victory regardless of whose turn it is. Now, in this position, therefore, our goal has to be to get our king to one of these squares. Conversely, what is Black's goal? Well, his goal will be to prevent us access to the key squares. Now that we understand, you know, what the name of the game is, so to speak, then we can quite easily actually assess this position as a draw. Why? Because here are the key squares. White will play a move such as king e3. Black will now go something like king d7. Then let's say king d4 or king e4 will be his choices. And here black will go either king d6 or king e6. And in either case, Black is preventing access to d5 and e5. And if we have some practice with these positions, we realize that once that access is prevented, then there's not much to be done for white to no way of making progress. Here, just by our understanding of key squares, you know, you may find this move because you have been taught about opposition. But even if you didn't have any clue about opposition, because opposition is more like a method, while key squares is more of a theory. 
Opposition is like a tool that you use to deprive your opponent of accessing the key squares. In my experience as a coach, most people have been taught the method without the, let's say, theoretical framework. And this is a little bit of a dangerous way of teaching King and Pawn endgame theory, because if you do so, your knowledge will be quite incomplete. And you might know that the opposition is something useful to strive for, but you may not be so ready to play the right move when you get some exceptional situations, you know, like, and all of a sudden you have to play a, an unconventional move, maybe give up the opposition because maybe there is a reserve tempo or something else going on. So by knowing the theory, we're a little bit better equipped to deal with unconventional situations. So here King D6, notice, takes the opposition, sure, but much more importantly, it's the only square from which black can deny white access to all of the key squares. Now white can go king to c4 or king to e4. Let's assume king to c4. Well, once again, these are the key squares. Black has to make a move, and the only move that he can play is king to c6 if he wants to keep the white king out. Now the white pawn advances to d4. Once it's advanced to d4, well, we have a shift of the key squares. We have c6, d6, and e6. Now, in this situation, black can hold the draw with the move king to d6. Let's see what happens if instead of king to d6, black goes king to c7. Well, king to c7, white will now go king to c5. He is now threatening to enter one of these key squares, so black must go king to d7. Now white goes king to d5. He is now threatening these key squares. And because black does not have the opposition, he's forced to push here or here. If he pushes to e7, white will access this particular key square. If he pushes to c7, white will access the e6 key square. And then we know that it's a win. So therefore, we can figure out that a move like king c7 is no good and we can see that king to c5 taking the opposition is a very powerful thing to do because it forces after king d7 king d5 it forces black to surrender access to one of the key squares that guarantees us the win however by playing instead of all of this by playing after king to d4 king d6 king c4 king c6 d4 Instead of the erroneous king c7, by playing the move king to d6, white cannot make any sort of progress and can therefore not threaten to go into one of the key squares. If the king has to go back, black can simply move forward and we sort of rinse and repeat. We are once again in a very similar situation. Sooner or later, white will have to push the pawn and we stay behind the pawn. King goes to d4 and now. In general, we should just stay behind the pawn. The truth is that if black goes king to c7 or king to e7, for now it's still okay. It only matters to stay behind the pawn when you're pushed onto white's eighth rank or your first rank. So that is the only time when it's absolutely essential, but in general, it doesn't hurt to stay behind the pawn and it builds a good habit. So let's say king to e5 and now king to e7. Now, here, for instance, is a case where black does have the opposition, but it's not the opposition that we're interested in. Remember, the opposition is like the axe that you would use to cut wood. We're not interested in the axe itself, we're interested in the wood, and we only use the axe if that's the best way we have of, you know, chopping wood, right? That's maybe a little bit of a weak analogy, I'm, I'm not so sure, but I hope it's helpful. So, for example, here, if the king goes to e7, we don't actually mind the fact that white has the opposition, because in this particular instance, this method doesn't get him anything that he's interested in, right? Doesn't allow him to make progress. King to d7, and now we must drop down behind the pawn to d8. Why? Because this time around, if we go king to e8, white will take the opposition, and after king to d8, d7, None of these squares are available. We must go to c7, king c7, king e7, and we lose. 
Similarly, if we push to c8, we also lose after king e6, king d8, d7. Well, we have returned to this situation. In this case, this is a situation of mutual zugzwang. What do I mean by this? Well, I mean that whichever side has to move is having to degrade their position substantially. Why? Because if it was white to move, instead of winning, he would have to play king d6 to hang on to the pawn, but in so doing, he would stalemate his opponent. Whereas it being black to move, he has to leave that d8 square and allow white access to e7. So therefore, in this position, we make sure that we drop to d8. Now, by dropping to d8, after king goes to e6, we now take the opposition. In fact, it's not so much about opposition as it is about key squares. What are the key squares for a pawn on d6? Well, if you're following the rule, you'll be saying, okay, d8 is a key square, c8 is a key square, e8 is a key square. And you will be right. These are all key squares. However, this pawn, being a sixth rank pawn, has actually gained an additional row of key squares. So all of these squares, if the white king arrives at them, will guarantee victory. So after king to c8, we would see that white would place his king on e7, which as we know, it's both of these rows that are now key squares, and this would guarantee victory. So right now, the question on your mind is probably no longer has to do with this position and what's going on in this specific position. You can probably understand that this is a draw simply because after king d4, black can shut the door on the white king. And after king e4, again, black goes king e6 and makes sure no access on this next move and no access on the move after. Why do I say this? Well, because if black went king to d6, then he does shut the door on the white king's access to any of the key squares on the next move. But after king to d4, the fact that white has the opposition means he will get to place his king on either c5 or e5 eventually. And once he does so, king e5, there is no way of holding back the pawn. Let's say if you push king to d7, I can take the opposition once more. King goes to e7, I will go king to c6, I'm making progress with my king. Now you're threatening perhaps to try and grab this pawn, but as I push, notice my pawn is now on the fourth rank and these are the key squares. I'm already on one of them. You will have to push the king, I will push d5. Of course, if king to c7, then king to e6, and I cannot push as I will lose the pawn, so I would have to go back, then we would get this same position. So that's why I push instead. Now if king goes to e8, I go c7, I will guide the pawn forward. If instead king goes to d8, I go king to d6. Remember, this pawn here means that at the very least, we have these three key squares. In fact, as we will soon see, we also have this second row, much like the pawn that was on the sixth rank. So therefore, we're already on a key square. And once again, by definition, a key square is a square that guarantees us victory, regardless of whose move it is. So if I asked you in this original position to give me an evaluation to tell me if white is winning or drawing, you would say to me, white is winning. But I haven't told you whose move it is. Then you could tell me it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because all of these are key squares. By definition, a key square guarantees us victory regardless of whose turn it is. So we don't need to know that. However, if instead of this position, the position was king here and king to d7, if we had this position and I asked you, is this a win or is this a draw? Then you would have to ask me whose move it is because it would absolutely depend. Why is that? Because a pawn here on d4 only has these three key squares. You do not as yet have this additional row. So that's probably something that by now you're wondering, why is it? Why are certain pawns giving us more key squares than others? So let's uh, talk about this in a second, but just to show you that in this position after d5, 
let's say the king goes here, king to d6. No matter where the king goes, it's an easy win. King to e7, king c7, d6, and the pawn cannot be prevented. So I just wanted to sort of show you that to finish and now explain to you guys what is going on with some pawns having more key squares than others.